Stanford University. My name is Barbara Babcock. I'm a professor emerita at the Stanford Law School and will be the moderator for today's discussion of pioneering women faculty at Stanford. This event is part of the Stanford Historical Society's Oral History Program. The Pioneer Women Project aims to capture the experiences of faculty members who were among the first women in their departments. What were those early days like for women? How were they initially treated by their male colleagues, students, and administration? And how did these relationships change or not over the next 50 or 60 years? Today, I will be talking with four of these women. Collectively, they have lived a total of 352 years. Arriving at Stanford between 1959 and 1976, they came at a time when there were very few women teachers here in any capacity. They have seen Stanford grow from a fine regional university to one of the best in the United States, indeed, in the world. At the same time as the amazing physical and financial growth these last 50 years have seen huge social changes, and the campus has been alive with protests against the Vietnam War, with the Civil Rights Movement, the Women's Liberation and Gay Rights Movement. Each of these women has been interviewed individually about her life and career as part of the Stanford Historical Society's Oral History Program. Audio tapes and written transcripts of those interviews are available through the Stanford Historical Society's Oral History Program website. I might add, uh, as moderator, that I was the first woman faculty member hired at the Stanford Law School and will be interviewed myself uh, in, the, in the second session of the next generation. So now let's meet our participants. To my left is Marion Lewinstein, Professor of Communication Emerita at Stanford and Academic Secretary to the University Emerita. Before coming to Stanford, she had a distinguished 30-year career as a print journalist and was among the first to ever write stories about the start of Silicon Valley. Out of 40 women candidates, Marion was selected to become the first woman faculty member in the Department of Communication in 1976. She was 50 years old at the time and went on to become an award-winning teacher of journalism. Next to Mar Marion is Lenore, or Lee, Hertzenberg. Lee is currently a professor in the Stanford Genetics Department. She arrived at Stanford 55 years ago when she was 24 as a research assistant in her husband, Lynn Hertzenberg's Stanford lab. Since then, she has moved up the ranks and has authored more than 450 scientific articles. She is an inventor who, as one scientist said, has left an indelible mark on the fields of immunology and cell biology. Together, she and her husband have generated hundreds of millions in royalty income for our university. Next to Lee is Nancy Packer, Professor Emerita of English at Stanford. Now retired, she is still an active and well-known writer of fiction, 
and she still teaches in the Continuing Studies program. A much beloved and very tough teacher, Nancy was Director of Freshman English and of Stanford's Creative Writing program for many years. She came to Stanford with her husband, Herb Packer, in 1958 when he was offered a job as professor in the law school. She started her Stanford career as a student in the creative writing program and ended holding an endowed chair in the English department. Eleanor Maccabee, at 97 years old, <laughs> Eleanor is the Barbara Kemble Browning Professor of Psychology Emerita. She is best known for her important contributions to developmental psychology and behavioral differences in children based on their gender. Eleanor came to Stanford in 1958 as an associate professor, recruited from Harvard, where she had been working as a lecturer and research associate. Eleanor was a highly respected psychologist nationally, being elected to the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine and American Association for the Advancement of Science. And so now I'd like to just make some general queries of our group and, um, and go around and have each respond to them. But at any point, if somebody triggers a story that you want to tell, uh, interrupt and tell it. So let's just have, let's just have a talk like um, ladies over lunch. <laughs> so, um, what was it like? Why don't you each tell your story of how you came here and what Stanford was like, uh, especially for women? And we'll start, shall we start from there, maybe? All right. The Department of Psychology, at the time I came, had only one woman in it, and that was the woman who ran Bing Nursery School. It wasn't Bing at the time, but it was a preschool that Stanford had. Edith Dowley, beloved in the whole community, would be the only woman's face at the faculty meeting. Um, it was an awesome group, I felt, when I came, because these were famous people in our profession. Um, the first issue that happened when we arrived, my husband and I are both psychologists, were both psychologists. Um, and um, the question was, which one of us should get an appointment in the psychology department? Why did there have to be a choice? Because at that time, there was a rule that two members of a married couple could not be in the same department. That is not true any longer, but it's just one of the symptoms of the fact that things have changed a great deal. I got the nod uh, partly because the person who had been teaching developmental psychology retired that summer when we arrived and they needed somebody to teach the courses. Um, so um, my husband then uh, went into the communication department. Um, I found, um, I suppose I should say, my situation was so different than the others of you. Lee, you came as a young woman, 22, is that what they said? 24. 24. I was 40 when I got here and had a little boy aged six months and a little girl almost three. I was right in the middle of the difficult years of child rearing. And so I got an appointment here as a tenured associate professor. And the first thing I did when I talked to the department chair was to say, I want to be half time. And I was, as far as I know, the first and only tenured woman that has had ever asked, there, there were so few of us. And for, from that time on, almost nobody ever asked to be half-time, but I did, and it worked out well for my family. I Nancy. came in 1958, freshly married, and I became a student in the creative writing program. I, I liked it a lot. got a fellowship in the creative writing program the second year. In the third year, Philip Roth was supposed to come to teach at Stanford, but he was... Uh, had a great success with his goodbye Columbus, and he decided not to come, and they were shorthanded. So they asked me to teach. I have always been very grateful to Philip Roth. <laughs> yeah, I was a lecturer after that for five or six years. Yeah, and then 
this, all the student troubles started. My husband was sort of on the firing line, and I wanted to be at the academic council meetings. So I went to Wallace Stegner, who was my mentor and my good friend, and I said to him, I want to be on the faculty so I can go to the uh, academic council meetings. And he said, OK. So I was. I don't think that could happen today. <laughs> I don't think any, <laughs> any individual would be as powerful today as Wally was at that point. In any case, I became an assistant professor and attended the academic council meetings, though I achieved nothing there. Then I became an associate professor and began teaching not just in the creative writing program, but in the English department. The lower level courses, because I was not anything like a scholar, I taught the novel and the short story. Uh, and then I became the um, director of creative writing and then the director of freshman English. And by that time, I was pretty tired and I retired. <laughs> And Lee Hertzenberg. Uh, my story is totally weird compared to all of those. <laughs> but that, uh, that'll make yeah. it good. Yeah. Well, I, I came at 24. I already had a nine-month-old and a three-year-old oh. at that time. <laughs> and uh, so that was fun. <laughs> but we had to, to manage with all of that. Len came as, as a, the first faculty member in the genetics department. And I had worked in his lab when we were with, with Minot at the Pasteur Institute, with, at the, the so-called golden era of, of the Pasteur Institute, when Minot and Lvoff were, were there. And that used to be a place where the, Minot was very welcoming of me. I don't know why I was, a, I was not quite 21 pregnant when we arrived from Caltech. And I had no degrees at all. I, I had done a year of undergraduate at Brooklyn College, then Len and I got married. And when I got to Caltech, uh, again, I don't know what they thought of me, this little Brooklyn accented kid running around, but I loved science, and I just begged to be allowed to, to sit in on classes, and they said, well, fine. There were no women admitted, no, no undergraduates, no graduate students. There was one woman postdoc in the department, and a number of women uh, research associates who were, uh, these days would be faculty members, but uh, they worked, one, Mary Emerson worked with her husband, um, Marge, can't remember her last name. But in any event, there were, there were women there um, who were mainly associated with husbands, um, except for Barbara McClintock, who came and was a major fi fix fixture in my life because she was, she just basically was, a, she was something other. Uh, she, she eventually was recognized and won a Nobel Prize and all, did all sorts of great things. But at that time, she was just recognized as, as, uh, as everyone said, there were nine professors of genetics, eight of them uh, listened to Barbara, and Andy Anderson was the only one who ever could speak to her. So <laughs> she was great. But, but this was the, the culture in which we were brought up. There were women who were top-level scientists who were in the department. And they all went to bat for me, I think. I don't know why. I mean, I just still don't know how they picked me out or why they picked me out. Or maybe I was just the only woman who ever, young woman who ever came this way. But they gave me a job, and they let me work um, for somebody and be a technician, although I wasn't much of one. Um, and they let me take classes, and I took the classes unrealizing that I was taking the undergraduate biology classes at Caltech, but there were no undergraduates in biology then. There were maybe two or three. The rest, so the class was really a graduate class. Uh, it didn't phase me. I took the class. I, I did the work. I got my grades. I got A's in all the classes, and they gave me letters that said that I'd taken that, and I preserved those letters and eventually parlayed them into a degree. Oh. But that only took 20 years to do. So I got here, and then we then went to Paris, and I went to, to Jacques and, and Manot and asked him, could I come and, and uh, could I work in, in the lab with Len? And he took pity on me. He said, I don't think it was pity. He actually, I, I, in retrospect, he, he was really you know, recognizing and very um, encouraging to get into science. So. Uh, there, everybody sat and had lunch. It's a very famous story that everyone had lunch 
in, in the lunchroom. There were 12 of us or 14 at table. And lunch attendance was required at lunch. That was like the seminar that, that Manoa and Lebeuf taught. And so I got, you know, I ate lunch with everybody. I learned what I learned, and that turned me into um, the scientist I am. Then we went to the NIH, and there uh, it was impossible for me to work with Len. No one, <coughs> excuse me, no one was interested in me working with Len anyway. And I worked with Bruce Ames for, as a technician. I was his first technician. He should not. He should never have had me as a first technician. I should never have had him as a boss. <laughs> but we got on, <laughs> and we managed. And, and then the second child was born, and he was very happy that I said I'm taking maternity leave. <laughs> but ultimately, we did publish a very important paper together, um, which he recognized. So I, I, it's not a complaint with Bruce, but just a. a, a that's what was. I mean, I was a pest as a, because I wanted to know why. Not or, or how a scientist will ask, not just do what he told me to do. And he wanted someone who would please do what I told you to do. I want to get this done. I can't blame him. I know exactly from my position where he was at. Anyway, uh, from that, I came here intending to go find a job as somebody's technician again. And uh, Len's lab was in chaos. And I just, the only thing to be done, the office, it was a new department. Um, Josh Lederberg and Esther had moved there from uh, Wisconsin, I guess it was, and everything was in chaos. And no, nothing had been ordered for Lens Lab. We had cultures coming, all sorts of stuff was happening. So I just came for, I said, okay, I'll spend three months and work, and get, get all this straightened out and get the lab running. And I, I'm still working in the lab, so <laughs> that's how I got there. Well, I got a phone call one day out of the blue asking me if I would come in and apply uh, for a one-year lectureship at Stanford's Department of Communication. And I didn't know Stanford had a Department of Communication. It was and, new. <laughs> and was absolutely uh, unprepared for the phone call. And I said, gee, I don't have the right background uh, for Stanford because I, too, don't have a college degree, I guess you have now, I still don't. Uh, I had taken courses at night, but later I was told by the people who compiled my uh, information that I would have been a junior <laughs> had I uh, stayed with uh, the night courses. But in any case, they said yes, they knew that I didn't uh, have any college degrees, but would I come in and get interviewed because I had been recommended by other people around the, uh, Stanford. I'd been a reporter for quite a long time, originally for Women's Wear Daily, uh, then for Time Magazine, and uh, with the company that produced Women's Wear called Fairchild Publications, started a technology paper which I ended up uh, being the first reporter for, and that's where I got my reputation as a technology reporter, um, and Time hired me as a technology reporter. At any rate, I came in and was interviewed and was told they were uh, interviewing other people and they'd get back to me. I had brought in a bunch of my material, and when about a month went by, they had told me in a week or two they would call. I didn't know the system then. Uh, at any rate, when a month or two months went by, I wanted my material back. So I phoned and asked, could I have my material back, assuming that they had chosen someone else. And they said, oh, well, it was down now to me and one other person. Could they please hold on to the material? I said, be my guest. <laughs> and uh, then I got a phone call from the then chairman, Lyle Nelson, uh, who offered me the job. And feeling, uh, I was elated and sort of wanted to get off the phone and start running around the house yelling. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I felt I had to be professional, so I asked what the salary would be, and he said 12500 And I said, well, that was too low uh, <laughs> that I expected more. And he said, well, gee, that's what we pay lectures, and there's nothing I can do about altering that. So I demurred and finally said, well, I would ex accept that salary, uh, still being on pins and needles. And I hung up the phone. The ki my kids tell me that I then leaped up and started yelling. <laughs> <laughs> running around the house. Um, 
any case, so I started as a lecturer in 19, the summer of 1975, and mid-year, uh, Lyle came to me and said there's going to be a, an assistant professor tenure line uh, opening, and uh, we would like to offer it to you. At that point, when I came in that year, they had two young uh, PhD uh, hires, one was a woman and one, uh, the other a male. And I said, what about Diane and, and Chuck? Because it seemed more logical to me that they would offer her to that. He said the faculty had voted to ask me. Uh, and so then I had to make a decision whether to go back to time uh, or to stick with academia. And I chose to stick with academia. Uh, the department was very welcoming. I had no problems as a woman in the department. I learned later, and I sort of was glad I hadn't known exactly at the, at the time of the hire, that in fact the hiring process for that lectureship was going to be a woman no matter what, because one of the people, the, the wife of one of the people in the department had made a fuss and threatened to sue the department because they had no women. Uh, this was Paisley's wife. My, the former chairman of the department whom I talked to two days ago, to refresh my memory, he's retired too, he says that woman never taught in the department and was a graduate student. At the time I was under, for years I was under the impression that she, had, she too had been a lecturer and not been offered anything beyond that. But in any case, uh, I remained in the department and went through a whole series of t title changes. I was a lecturer, then when the offer for a permanent situation or a tenured position was made, uh, I accepted it, at which point I think I was 50, um, and did the five or six years as assistant professor, and then came up uh, for a tenure, and the ch chair of the department and the provost, I, I passed tenure, uh, and the chair of the department and the provost said, told me that they thought rather than go on to an assistant professor, that it made sense to, they called it a jump, to adjunct professor, and that would settle whether I had to go through any other procedures or not. And I, it didn't matter to me, so I said, fine. And then somewhere along the line, I was told, oh, they were going to make me professor of t teaching, which is what I thought I remained at. But again, talking to my former chair, he tells me, no, that that got changed to professor of communication, that it was, I didn't have the teaching uh, uh, part on it. He also told me a story that I hadn't heard before, which was in turning in all the material needed for uh, the a and committee to judge whether I was going to get tenure or not, that some of them, the material, were profiles I had done of people in the early stages of Silicon Valley. And he not only wrote to my editors uh, to confirm my background, but wrote to some of those people I profiled to ask what it had been like to be interviewed by me. And apparently... Who were they? Um, Hewlett and Packard and Bill Noyce, uh, Bob Noyce. People, right? Yes. <laughs> and I, uh, I guess the Hewlett and Packard had been a, a trustees because apparently some, it turned out that some of them were trustees who wrote back, he tells me, glowing reports. Uh, so it was fun to, to learn that in, information. Uh, but then I went on doing the usual kind of teaching that one would that expect. is so uh, this together you, uh, these stories are so so different from each other but the picture that you do get uh, is is of a school uh, that had very very few women anywhere in any department many departments had never had but even I would one. like to say Barbara that it seems to me from all these stories none of us really felt that there was prejudice against us as women I certainly never did. Did any of you? No. That's, yes. That's what I just said. Yeah. You did. Yes. Speak not, up. Not so much prejudice as indifference. Yeah. 
that didn't, didn't assume anything from me. It was, uh, I didn't feel that I was an equal, uh, treated oh, as I an see. equal. And there were very few women in the department, so it was hardly open. But although English had more women as majors and PhDs than any other department, there were still very few women teaching in the English okay, department. Okay, that's at a that different time. experience than mine. Yeah, I, I felt uh, no difference one way or an, another, and we were a relatively well, small it, it department. Was, what I'm trying to say is that they were indifferent. Yeah, I understand. It's not, but it was not meant, that they hated me. No, no. <laughs> But I, I didn't feel the indifference, which is what I meant to, to say. I was asked for my opinion about many things, uh, included in various were, small groups. You were both in communication. No, and Nancy was, was in the psychology. No, her husband was in communication. Yes. yes. So you had strengthened that department in the sense that you had. A male, one, who, a male who, who, who was, a, a, and, and I think there was more, more actually. One. <laughs> there, there, there was more than one, and that, that department was actually very special, I think, in, mm -hmm. it, at that time. There was a woman in the English yeah. department before I joined it. Uh, her name was Bailey, Marge Bailey. She was a Shakespearean. She never spoke a word to me. In the, all the years that we overlapped, it was total <laughs> indifference. <laughs> It was okay. I didn't know if she had I, she had nothing I particularly wanted to hear about. <laughs> well, there's another side of this. Um, as feminism grew, the question of whether you were being privileged because you were a woman that yeah. people thought maybe you weren't quite as good as the others, but you had been That's let what in. I felt after I discovered that that original group from which I had been selected were only women, and the purpose of hiring the lecturer yes. was to hire a woman. And I always felt a little guilty about that, knowing <laughs> some of my male friends who probably would have enjoyed if they had the offer made But to most them. of us came into the university through the back door, not Eleanor. Eleanor came in through the front door, but I think I certainly came in through yeah, the back door. Yeah, obviously I, I, I certainly did. did. <laughs> I certainly did. So the, the back door was an easier entrance to this university. Well, I began point. to feel like a token person um, when I began to be put on committees because um, the number of tenured women was so few that and people began to think every university committee, all the university yeah. committee, should have a woman on it. And so I would be appointed to this and to that and to that. And Almost every time when I went into the first meeting of a committee meet of that kind, who do you think I met there? Jim Gibbs. He was the only tenured black person <laughs> in the anthropology department he was. And it got to the point where we would walk into the first meeting of a committee, we'd see each other and burst out laughing. And so tokenism was there. Yeah. Yeah, I... I, I added to my problems, actually. Uh, first of all, there were no women that I know of who that I can remember who were appointed to the faculty, possibly Jody Goldstein, uh, who was the wife of the chairman Jody, of Pharma College. Yes. I don't remember whether Jody actually had been appointed or not. But the medical school was devoid of women. Yes. Uh, it was full of, of the men who made women jokes all over the place. These were the doctors that stood around the operating Ouch. table and made all these <laughs> cracks. Okay, it was, it, was, it was that way. Our department itself was a little bit different because Esther Lederberg had worked very closely with Josh, but she was a, a, a difficult person, and she certainly never had any truck for me, uh, partly because I had children and she wanted to. It, it was one of those complicated ouches. Uh, and she was just a strange woman. I, I, I liked her well enough, but it was not somebody who, who, you know, in principle, she could have become a defender, but she was not. Uh, she was not on the attack for me. She just was indifferent to me, if you like. But um, I compounded my problems in the medical school fairly quickly in terms of being accepted there. Um, everybody knew me because we had, Glenn and I ran uh, minority programs. We started the, the first, I had, I had a big, um, during the period 1960 to 1970, uh, we ran a big um, 
upward bound type problem project Good for you. from from uh, Ravenswood High School. Andrea Stryer, Lubert Stryer's wife, and I ran that program, uh, and that was. You, let me interrupt for a minute and yeah. ask you how you did. Did you all just design that yourself, or did you? What made you do that? Oh well, this is Len and I. I mean, Len, Len and I lived our lives very much as two sides of one coin. <laughs> okay, always. Um, he read and I wrote. This, that may seem strange, but I was explaining this to somebody the other day that we never understood how that worked. But I wrote virtually everything that ever came out of our lab. Uh, I was an, at least an editor on, and when it came to grant applications and all that stuff, I mean, Len had some of the finest grants in, in the world, but uh, you know, there were outstanding investigator grants, and they're based on your, your accomplishments, but you have to write the application. And, <laughs> Len would sit there, pick up the pencil, and that was the end of it. I mean, he could not, did not ever write. And so, and I was a writer from when I started to grow up. So I wrote, and he read. Um, I read, of course, and of course, he sometimes picked up a pencil, but rarely. Um, he, he would, you know, he'd write letters and notes, but, but to write manuscripts was not his thing. So, you know, it was, it was always that way. It was very, very... Um, Oh, I don't know. <laughs> did he, did, um, I, I'm, I'm so interested in the overlap and the stories between, uh, between, about having a mentor or somebody who really did mm -hmm. help you, you know, uh, Lyle Nelson and, and Wallace Stegner in your Bo case. Bob and, Sears. And Bob Sears and, and then your husband, Len, and, um, and with you, it, Lyle, Lyle Nelson, Lyle Nelson right, also, yeah. yeah. And that, how, how important it was to have. There wasn't, I don't think that this, Marion uh, in 1976 looks like the communications department made a all-out sort of primitive affirmative action strike there, hiring 40 women. We won't try to have the women compete because <laughs> they might not win uh, if we... Uh, we just have them compete against men. We won't have them compete against men. They'll just compete against each oh, other yeah. and we'll get a <laughs> woman. Selection. Yeah, that's not the way affirmative action is done right. anymore. <laughs> but it's great. But it but that that is the first hint I get in anybody's stories of the of the fifties, sixties and seventies of the university as an institution reaching out and trying to get more women. Or advance more I mean, women. No, nobody was interested in hiring me as a woman. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, actually, no one was in. But, but I, I really made myself, if you like, persona non grata because I was a leader in the anti-war movement, and nobody liked me for that, and no one liked Len for that, and that was a, a long, long story, which which is a history that probably should be dug out at some point, but uh, definitely. There was a schism that developed because very early on, Len and I both were in the anti-war movement. But it was me, not Len. Uh, he was busy doing academic stuff. He was on study sections in Washington. But we were both very much in that movement. And before that, it was the two of us who decided that, that black kids had a place in school and in society. And so we built these, these very initial programs. When they became available from the government, Len set out to get grants for them. And, you know, we did, as I say, I wrote most of whatever went on in the family anyway. So it was really, um, I was in a different position. I had scientific men mentors, if you like. I mean, of course, mentors, but um, not, not in the way of, of smoothing places for me, just people I collaborated with who took advantage of what I knew. Hugh McDevitt was a, a very important person in, at that time. And he was a collaborator with us. So uh, <coughs> later on, there was a, eventually somebody came in, investigated the department, and said, How come this person is publishing all these papers and has all this and is not appointed to the faculty? And said, Well, we have enough, what Len does is enough for us. And somebody else apparently said to them, No, this wasn't right. And so I wound up eventually becoming a, a, a first a, a research associate and then promoted up from that. And ultimately, when um, the department came into its new chain of leadership, uh, David Botstein, Luca Cavalli-Sforza, 
uh, were people who promoted me into the academic line. But to, to this day, I'm still an adjunct professor. That's about to change, I think. <laughs> but <laughs> they have done away with their title. Never no, I am truly an adjunct professor. I have all the rights and privileges there. But Mike Snyder and the, the chairman before him and the chairman before him all always accorded me the um, rights and privileges, yeah, if you no, like. I, I attended I faculty meetings. I thought meetings the title and... itself had disappeared. No, no, the title itself is, at, at least, <laughs> I tell you, it still exists. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, you, maybe the last. You may be right. We should find out. You no, know, because I was an I was academic secretary at the time they did away with that. It wasn't oh. quite an accident, by the way, that this push happened for um, people in the med school who were working in laboratories, often in their husbands' laboratories, publishing wonderful papers, doing good research, doing teaching, actually, but not getting into a, a faculty stream appointment. And uh, that came up in a committee that I was a member of in what year I don't remember. Um, people began to look all around the university and find how many of these so-called adjunct appointments there were for women who were very talented. And so our committee began to pressure on that. And one of the things we aimed at in particular was the medical school. And so Rose Payne and Judy Poole. Judy Poole was a member of I our am. committee, yes. Was she? Yeah. And, and uh, she was wonderful. And Dodie Goldstein was one of the first people that we took notice of. But in any case, the, the medical school group, Judy Poole and I don't know who else, took that over as a committee and worked right. there. Uh, but it, the same kind of thing was going on all through the university at that time to try to uh, upgrade academic, into an academic stream, people who should be there. And, and that was a good place to start. Did, did, yes. did you feel that that was part of a movement? Was that part of the feminist oh, movement? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yes. and when? When did that happen? That's what I'm trying to remember. When was Judy Poole well, active in the... the late 80s is my memory of it. I was thinking it might have been earlier. The feminist movement had funny sides to it. The students gave a push to it sometimes. And do you remember, what year was it that the students um, occupied Encina Hall? 1972. One or two. There was, One or there two. Was two. Okay. Well, Encina that, was that year at um, the graduation ceremony, we were still having um, graduation ceremonies in um, Frost. Frost Amphitheater. And I remember we were all lined up, the faculty in our robes and whatnot, starting to walk up that incline, you know, that goes up so that before you go down into Frost Amphitheater. As we were walking up, here up on the hill beside us was this group of students with a long printout. They had the salaries of every faculty member in the university. And up to that time, that was a deep secret. You never asked anybody what their salary was. Nobody knew what yours was and so on. And here they were saying, here comes Professor so-and-so in economics. He earns such and such. Do you think he's worth it, they would say to each other. And they went <laughs> after each person coming up, they would have something to say about them. Then I came up. Ah, they said. Here comes the lowest paid full professor in the university. <laughs> Do you think that's because she's a woman, they said. <laughs> and believe it or not, I got a nice raise the next week. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think I know who must have been there at that time. I actually saw, saw them not so long ago. It was probably Jeannie Friedman was, was do, doing that stuff. And that's I, I will tell her this story. <laughs> this, <laughs> she, well, but see, I, I sat in the, in this very peculiar place because I was part of that student movement and very much a part of it. And, and my friends are still part of it. And so we sat on the opposite sides of a table back at that time. Uh, Eleanor, when we were talking about um, how things were for women when you first came, I remember a great story you told in your... Um, Oral history. Could you could you tell oh, us again? I think I know which one you mean. Um, sexual harassment has recently become very widespread, un, more widely understood than it has for you know than it used to be. 
uh, now that it's uh, emerged as an issue in the armed forces and so on. But it's always been present sort of under the, uh, out, outside of the headlights, uh, under the radar, and in the academic world. You can see there are so many opportunities for um, men who want to prey upon their graduate students, their undergraduate students, uh, even their colleagues. Um, they are usually in a position to do favors for women and to offer favors like better grades even if people are compliant to them. Um, so in view of the fact that people began to realize that this is an issue and that women need to be protected, um, the university did set up a committee, which I was a member of, where men who, are being, who were accused by any of their students um, were brought in and talked to about it. Um, it was a very fascinating committee to be on, you may be sure. But one of the things that struck me most strongly about it was the ego quality of these men. They found it impossible to believe that their advances were unwelcome. Uh, that had to be uh, impressed upon them. They, they went out looking puzzled, uh, not really ashamed, I think, because they didn't quite believe it. But, uh, it became clear to them that uh, their actions were under surveillance now, and I think that did make a difference. When I came to Stanford in 1972, it was the troubles, as it was called. You the know, troubles. The, uh, yes, the troubles were yeah. going on, and and people. On. Hmm? You, you you brought peace. <laughs> right. But but people really, and and I didn't I didn't see any of the actual action, but I had a sense that um, um, that, the, that the university was hurting, um, you know, that the, a lot of people's feelings had uh, been involved and the students and, and uh, faculty had become alienated from each other and it was, um, I mean, that's the way it seemed. But, uh, but now these troubles have been largely forgotten. Did, did the, Not by everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I certainly remember them. You certainly remember them. Yes, but that won't be a whole lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. in many ways, one of the things that Stanford history should do and could do would be to really deal with this, this history. There is a historian of the movement who's kept all the papers. Who had, we, we kept a library alive for a long time. And we still every year get together, and we got together this year, and, and hear speakers, and get some of the new students to come and, and whatever. But, but the point is that the history of that movement will die. And it's really too bad because it was the most powerful movement in the country. That there was Yale and Berkeley. Berkeley was where it started, then Columbia. But, but the fact was that Stanford was the intellectual center of it. As far as I knew at the time, we were generating the documents that, that were the, well, that, that's, it's another history, but it really should be told because it's, it's, we should talk about this at some point because there's a lot of stuff on this mm -hmm. that, that's there. But what I, for me, I was part of that. So I was, I was kind of one of them and not one of us. And this, this was another part of our problem. And when that committee was started and I went to them and I said, you know, I belong with this too. And they basically said, well, we don't know what to do with you because you work with your husband, and we can't, you know, we can't say because you work with your husband, and so we're really not interested in you. And that's I, amazing I, to me because Dodie was very active in that whole thing, and she worked with her husband. Dodie was the one who said that to me. I don't. Th I think that was a euphemism for we can't handle you, and you will hurt our movement if we really associate with you, and. The, well, and her movement was was to get more women. They were, they were working yeah. on getting getting um, more recognition for women research at the place. But again, I didn't have you know any formal line of of, of appointment. I was out, outside at all. I didn't have the degree. I was just I was an anomalous woman, and um, it's okay. I mean, I think I just finished after thirty years. I finally this last month proved something that we had said that was sort of radical, if you like, in terms of immunology, and was not accepted for 
1986, whatever it was that we published the first article. And we finally finished the absolute airtight nails in the coffin proof this year. But it's that kind of thing that, that, I mean, my love is science and my love is computers because I do a lot of work with that. Uh, but it's taken me through a lot of movements and our lab always had the, the, the reputation as the social service movement, the political radical movement, and we weren't really radical. I mean, we were in the anti-war movement, but uh, we were not throwing stones. We were not doing anything like that. And uh, I spent the time doing investigative reporting in, in, in the movement. We figured out who did all the violent acts that we knew about. Remember the fire that was set in, in, the, um, in the old, um, oh, in yeah. the horse barn? Uh, I wasn't here, but I read there, about it. There was a fire that. that was set there. there well, there were, were some bricks thrown through the windows of the Hoover Institution. Yes. Well, the, the president's office. President the, Sterling's office was burned up. Burned yes. Everything. Right. He lost all yeah, of his papers. Burned, oh, my there, God. There was, fire. there was one person who led most of that in the movement. That the movement did not have the sense to throw him out. I don't know why. Are you talking about Bruce Franklin? No. Definitely. Bruce never, we never let Bruce lead anything in the movement. This is a big fiction that went on. Bruce himself wanted to be known as the leader of this movement. We, being the people who did the leading, made, had meetings where we would, I hate Bruce to hear me say this, but I mean, we set up meetings where we were certain he would not be able to come. <laughs> because we wanted, we did not like his his brand of everything. So he did what he wanted to do. I, I told this story at, at his trial hearing because he was actually fired for something that I and a few other people organized, which was the sit-in in, in the uh, thing. But he wanted to be known as the leader of that. And so at the very end of it, he got up in front of the microphone and he said, OK, let's go occupy the building. If you had a film on everybody who was walking through there, most of them were gone from that space because the, the occupation had already started. But Bruce was Bruce. That was another aside. <laughs> but, I, I'm curious, uh, Nancy and, and Eleanor, after you joined your departments, how many more women started showing up uh, as a faculty? Lot, quite a lot in my department. Mm -hmm. There were uh, maybe by 1965, Four, five new women had been appointed in the English department. When I first came in, there were no women among the assistant professors, the young people coming up ready to be asked to be kept for tenure if they turned out to be good enough. The pipeline, in other words, at that point didn't have women in it, and they be, it began to be the case that there were women there. Now. Initially, most of the women who did come in were interested in clinical psychology. Yeah. They wanted to become therapists. Yeah. At that time, the psych department at Stanford taught clinical psychology. And then came the big decision where we decided not to. And we separated the clinical department away, and it, clinical psychology began to be treated, taught in the medical school. And at that point then, there were fewer women in the pipeline coming to the, the, the science side of psychology, which is what the department became. But sooner or later, they began to be no, more numerous there, too. And I would say that um, their representation has become, in the psych department, at least equal. 50-50? Uh, that's what I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. Right about now, I believe so. I'm not sure. It's probably true I'm in the English department, too. The communication department, uh, the PhD student, uh, person who had, was finishing her PhD, Diana, uh, who came in at the same time I did, continued on as an assistant professor until tenure line and she didn't make it. And I'm realizing I don't recall that any other woman came up either as an assistant professor or an advanced uh, degree. Now, I'm just thinking in the psych department, it really depends on which subfield of the, of the discipline you are in. There are more men in the neuroscience side of our department and more women in the social science side. Is that true in other departments or is it just that it happened to 
I think it's true in every department in the country, as far as I know. These are differences in interests that the two sexes have, yeah. continue to have. Continue at, yeah. at, at the same rate, that is to say, no changes uh, of uh, undergraduates, undergraduate majors in psychology or PhD candidates. Still, the women are concentrated. I can't say still, because I've been retired for low these many years and haven't yeah, but been Eleanor, to... you know everything. You know everything. No, I do not. <laughs> But uh, I, I'm just making the point that um, there remain some gender differences um, that have more to do with what people are interested in doing. I'm just well, wondering if that has changed at all, because psychology would be a really good study of, of that particular question of whether or not women's interests have changed as women's opportunities have enlarged. As their opportunities have enlarged, they're, um, they have more and more um, women have gone into biology. And they'll go into biology rather than physics if they have a choice, usually, having to do with the fact that they're interested in human beings more than in math. Now, and, and it's still true, I believe, that women are, quote, underrepresented in math. Well, but things, there's more of them coming in. I thought from things I've read that, in fact, at the uh, undergraduate and graduate level, particularly the graduate level, women are still sort of pushed aside so that that might explain what happens in terms of uh, academia. I've got to be careful to be accurate about this because I know that now uh, women do better, I think this is true, uh, people who are graduating from college and those who have majored in math the women do fully as well as the men, and sometimes better. Uh, so um, I don't want to derogate in any that way. That would be self-selective, wouldn't it? Yes, it would be. Um, and uh, but even kids graduating from high school, uh, the women, the girls in high school are doing as well in math or better than the average boy. But uh, they are making choices about what to go into from then on. And they're also not taught about the women who were leaders in mathematics throughout history. I mean, you, you know the names of the men. Uh, do you know Lovelace? Uh, do you know there, there are people who provided as much mathematical leadership women, but were not talked about that way. And Helen Pauling, who was Linus Pauling's wife, told me a lot of stories like this. I, I at some point, said, Helen, can I interview you? And I went there with my little tape recorder. The things, I've lost the tapes. It is criminal that I lost them. Linus very much disapproved of Helen talking to me. Very, very much. But she told me a lot about the early days of physics. And she said, well, the guys, because Linus and, and Schroeder and Schrodinger and all these people would get together, Einstein, she knew Einstein quite well. Um, and he was apparently much more forthcoming with, with women, but, but everybody says, well, he was a ladies' man. That wasn't it, I think. I think he saw people and not, not women. That was Helen's view. And, but, you know, they, the, the men would, would go off in one room, and the women would go to another room to talk after dinner. Yes. And she says, well, I just went with the men. She says, they didn't mind. They were happy if I went along with them. But, and I did the same thing myself. I mean, I didn't go and sit with the women yeah. because uh, there was, it was more interesting Same to here. me. I know yeah. what you're talking so, about exactly at social yeah. occasions. That's interesting yeah. that at least three of us and maybe four of us uh, uh, at an early stage started separating ourselves off and going with the males. The law school dean would have dinner parties, Carl Spaeth would have dinner parties, and after dinner, we, the women would go in one room and the men would go in another. That's, that's I remember the, the first time I went, I was quite shocked, but I went. <laughs> <laughs> I followed everybody to the women's area. It was these kinds of things that we're all talking about now that had a big bearing on um, the choice of research that I finally did go into. Um, I, I was beginning to be more and more irritated with some of the um, myths, I should say, the shibboleth things that are said about women. Um, women are from Venus and men are from Mars and 
women are, the one that bothered me the most was the clinical psychologist who asserted that women are by nature passive while men are active. Well, sure we are. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so f one day a young woman walked into my office, this is Carol Jacklin, she had just finished a PhD and she wanted a postdoc with me. We started to talk about what we would want to do and um, I had a colleague in the department who was a very fierce feminist and she had said to me, if I ever got any result in my research that might be used to the detriment of women, I should not publish it. And I talked with Carol Jacklin about this and, and asked her how she felt about that. She said, I don't agree with that. The truth will make us free. And I hired her right then. Good. And we decided that we would go after, we would try to put together the information that really existed on the characteristics of the two sexes. Was it true that women were more passive or that they, uh, oh, all kinds of strange things had been reported about women. For example, uh, there's a, a little test that is used called the prisoner's dilemma, where you have a chance to sell out your partner or not. And somebody had published a paper saying that the girls who, women, college women, who took this test were more likely to sell out their partners than the males were. And we, um, took that as an example of where it was necessary to see if anybody else had found any results com comparable on this issue. So we set about um, gathering together all the studies we could lay our hands on. Uh, and we discovered pretty soon that it was often the case that if people tested their sample on whatever they were studying and compared males and females and found no difference, they never published that. And it was only the ones that got a difference that were being published. So we got on the telephone and telephoned people who, that we knew had studied a certain thing. We knew they had both sexes. Had they ever compared them, what had they found? So we put these things all together into this big book called The Psychology of Sex Differences. We had each trait like aggressiveness on one table, all the studies that had been compared the two sexes and so on. Um, and we found that most of the, of, of the beliefs about the characteristics of the two sexes are simply myths. They were not true on the basis of, the, of all the research that had been done. A few were true. Males are more aggressive or ha had been found at that time to be so. Girls were found to be more verbal in the sense that they would talk more to each other when they get together than males do. Uh, but almost nothing else came out as a significant effect and many of the things that were widely believed were not true. So um, when I'm asked, did feminism um, influence my research? I would say certainly because um, Carol Jacklin and I would not have written that book if we hadn't already been energized about the issues. But also I think we had a big impact on feminism, at least. Um, we became the darlings of the feminist movement because of this myth-busting book. I later wrote a book that, was, um, that showed some, some differences that were real, and I became much less popular <laughs> <laughs> with the feminists. Um, but this was a period, I think, uh, in a certain sense, there was a wave of feminism that it, it made huge changes during all of our professional lives. And when Just do you think record, that was? What, did you, what was the book, what was the, was the finding in the book that let, made you less popular? The second book? Yeah. You really want to know? Well, I think so. <laughs> we, yes, Obviously yes. Obviously you're reluctant, therefore, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It was um, a study with children, all of whom were 33 months old. There were 92 little kids in this study and uh, they weren't quite three years old yet. Um, we brought in pairs of children who had never seen each other before and it was either two girls or two boys or a boy-girl pair. We brought in toys for them to play with. There were opportunities for things to be touched and used and whatnot in the room. Um, if we and the thing that 
absolutely blew me away was two boys, the level of social interaction quite high. Two girls, the level of social interaction higher, significantly higher, but very active, the two girls. Boy-girl pairs, the level of interaction down. And much of it had to do with the fact that the girl would stand back and let the boy play with whatever it was. I hated that finding, <laughs> but it is true. But it's Could it have been size? Being girl. Pardon me? It's not inherent in being girl. It just Could tells it? you that the socialization that has her stand back there, starts there much earlier. There we have the big earlier. question. What does it do to it? That's right. But, but it's, an equally, it's an equally reasonable hypothesis that... that and, and we know now that socialization starts that much earlier. Oh, socialization starts early. That's absolutely well, true. What about size? The I mean, girls, boys are generally bigger. Not at that age. Not at, they're not? No. Okay, no. they're not. Right. They are stronger at that age. Stronger. Well, that might be the reason for the Where the girls' reticence. There, there are lots of, there, there are very interesting things. I, you probably explored a lot of them. But, oh, we, we went yeah. after that finding. I tell you, yes, we had a girl or a boy walking up a kind of sidewalk that we made on the floor of the room, another kid standing there. And you wanted to see how close they would get to that other person. And um, when the girls, each sex would stop sooner if that child was the different sex. Um, and the girls especially did not want to get closer. And then we thought, oh, it's because they know that boys are rough. And we, um, we th they know that that boy was rough because we first started it out, kids coming from the same classroom. So we brought in a boy they'd never seen before, and they still were hesitant to walk up close to them. This is a profound fact about childhood. Um, and I see where your mind immediately goes, of course it's socialization, my goodness. No, 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 I'm just saying that you can't rule out socialization oh, at all. Oh, who would want to? I, I, I know. certainly I mean, it's, want that's to. a very interesting area of, of well, you know, where we're Well, all I'm saying left. is we brought this up as a very interesting area, and we were not willing to say that, of course, it was socialization. Oh, that's fair. And therefore... You were unpopular. You got you were, it. <laughs> were, were you really, uh, Eleanor? I don't... Uh, that, that's why I want to pin down where, when this happened. Was this in the mid-'80s that... When, when would you say when that... When did you publish that book? 1973. Oh, that, that book early. was 1973. The second book? The first book. The first no, book, book yeah. The oh, the yeah. second one was much later, 1990. 90. I think. Yeah. Wait a minute. I don't think it was that late. No, it wasn't. It was 83. I'm thinking of a different book. Yeah. Because I remember you and I having a discussion. You didn't like my interpretation. <laughs> 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 said, all you media people. <laughs> well, I, I want to see what, uh, when the, 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 troubles at Stanford uh, or the anti, the effects of the anti-war movement. And then that passed and sort of melded into the civil rights movement. No, no, it so actually was the other way around, that the civil rights movement began before the anti-war movement. Uh, and that, that there yes, was a big right. argument about whether the two should merge. And there was a very strong feeling in each case that the other uh, thing would be politically unhandleable, and so it, it ultimately, you know, ultimately they merged, we merged, whatever. But there was a big discussion about that well, at the, the time. The three movements: civil rights, anti-war, and feminism. Feminism. Now, when was the feminism uh, at full? Well, when I force? joined Stanford in the summer of '75, uh, there was a group. I think Elizabeth Cohn uh, from yes. so, uh, sociology. Uh, was leading informally, and I guess you were part of it. And we used to meet outside of Jordan Hall. For some reason, we'd meet at lunchtime outside. And that, I think, was the beginning group. I don't know whether you were also part of it, Nancy, then. Uh, and then it got more formalized, and eventually, of course, ended up as the gender yeah. studies. So. When was that? 75, the summer of 75. It might have started before then, but... The uh, Center for Research on Women and Gender was the first of those groups to be formally... Yeah, that's what it's... And uh, that happened because Myra Strober in oh, the School Myra's of part. Education came over to interview me with two other students, and they said they wanted to raise some money 
to create this organization, and would, they needed a, a tenured faculty name on this to, for their application, and they got me and Jim March, and the two of us signed for it. And we certainly did not take leadership of the organization once it happened. Well, all we did was help raise the money for it. But that has... That's a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Jim Marsh, who, what department was he in? He was in three departments. Oh, Business, education. Him. Political science. Yes, right. He was a big name on campus. Yeah, uh, I know the name, but I don't, don't remember was, his being involved. He was a very interesting guy. Mm -hmm. So that morphed into the Institute for... I think so. Uh, th then it was the Institute for Research on Women and Gender for a while, well, Earwig, and then it was, um, and uh, now it's yes. the Clayman Institute, which is yes, that's really right. kind of fabulous. It's uh, what? The Clayman Institute. That's that's old crow. Did you know that? Did you no, realize, I didn't realize that? that. Yeah. yeah. And those it, uh, those acronyms, I know. It was old crow. Well, it used to be the Center for Research on Women. We came very close to calling it the Center on Women. And Which would have been a mistake. That would have been cow. Uh, but, but the uh, cow, <laughs> right. But then but we, we got, thought that crow wasn't very good either. I thought crow was good. I did know? too. Crow was yeah. actually very bad for a different reason, that, that there was a group of generals during the um, Vietnam era who called themselves the, the, the crows or the old crows. Oh. And in fact, there was a bunch of kids who formed a movement, I think it was 1973, Three who formed a committee called the Young Crows <laughs> to, to go oh, after the old crows. Oh, I see. Crows. I, I didn't know about that. At the they time, I liked crows. it because I didn't think Earwig was any better. Well, I don't think Earwig was very good. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I thought it was ridiculous. Um, I, I will tell you that, that there was, during the anti-war movement, there was a strong feminist. But, I mean, this was, again, the men were leading this movement, but there were some very, very strong women. I mean, I was older than, than most of them, so, you know, I kind of sat back as the faculty I, I'm used to make chicken soup for everybody the, the <laughs> faculty the faculty mother whatever but um, of the young women some of them really Margie Cohn is probably best known and she, she's who was uh, Marjorie Cohn who was one of one of the and there was a lot of discussion in the coordinating committees about how to you know get more strength given to the women and the women were asking for it uh, most of the men felt it ought to happen but there was still major gender. I mean, we all came from, from a generation where, where the women knew their place. So this was breaking all these new kinds of, kinds of barriers to women. Um, I think th those women are around. They're very interested. So I say it would be fun to actually talk about the history of that movement because that places it very cleanly between 1969 and 71 or 72. And then they went on to do the rest of this stuff from a historical point, yeah. the discussions in that coordinating committee are, are really worth recalling. No, the the um, uh, it, no, it is the the, the seventies and and um, was was when it seems to me that the university began to take um, you know have concern and take an interest in getting more women and in in uh, ad, advancing them. Um, well, I think Dick Lyman, as the provost, was very instrumental in opening a lot of doors for women. Yeah. His wife was a, a feminist. She did, but didn't have a, a, a position here at the university, but she was a, a leader of, of, of some substance. <laughs> she, yeah. she was. Jane Lyman. Yeah, yeah, she was a very oh, tall you bet woman. she was. I yeah. think she played a role. Estelle Friedman from history and I, it turned out, had been hired at the same time. And I don't remember, it must have been after I became assistant professor, Jing Lyman had a luncheon at Estelle, that was where I met Estelle, and there were four maybe other people. And it wasn't until later that I realized that she was pushing the women by sort of getting them acquainted with each other and, <laughs> and giving them a method for trying to put somebody together and go forward. Well, so do any of you all have have stories or remembrances of of the women's movement being a help to you or an influence on you or you or vice versa? Um, well, it obviously it, helped us all, in in that it must have smoothed the way for us to 
to progress at this university. Not in a sp specific way, but obviously it opened things for us. I have to say, I'm going to take a contrarian view here for a minute. You? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I was, I was disturbed a bit at the beginning by the feminist movement. I thought that it was knocking the civil rights interests away. And I thought that, and I, I, and I think it did, uh, make a, a, for less interest in civil rights. So I was kind of, I thought, we don't have it so bad, us women. I felt that, uh, of course I was lucky. That was all right for me to say. But I felt that it did in some ways interfere with the civil rights movement, the same way that I thought the student movement, the anti-war movement, interfered with the civil rights movement. But then that was followed by the feminist movement. And it, uh, we really haven't, uh, haven't really recovered the impetus that we had in the civil rights movement, I think, since that time. Since this, you mean the civil rights since, movement since hasn't the, recovered? Since the feminists, the anti-war, and the fem things were really going well in the early 60s, I thought. I also went over and uh, tutored in East Palo Alto, and a lot of people did. It was very, people were really active, really concerned, and then it sort of died away. But you, you, you think in a sense that the, the... It's hard to sustain three movements at the same time. Right, yeah. Well, I'm not sure that they should be separate, though. I mean, I think the problem, uh, maybe, I, mean, I, I grew up in a situation because Len was who he was, and believed as he believed, he really did not see black, white, women, not women. His feeling, he, we trained, if, if we look at the people who came through our lab, the women who came through our lab, uh, they were, uh, one of them became the top woman in immunology in um, England. Uh, Pat Jones trained in our lab. Um, there was uh, a woman named Johanna Laster who became the Berlin High Commissioner for AIDS. Um, uh, a couple of Amherst professor of UMass. I mean, people, Len's belief was very clearly that if he brought someone into the lab and that person did training there, he was not going to see them not have an equal position to the men who were in the lab. And so I grew up in an environment where women and men were treated equally. That we, we fought out all our battles. Len and I were well known to have battles at, at, over whether this cell or that cell was the right cell at, at a lab meeting. I <laughs> was never known to hold my peace in, in any particular way. But Len really made the difference. So we had immunology and microbiology had the same group of interested people, the same group of students. But Len made the difference because he was chairing a lot of, of the meetings. And he just kept asking, well, where are the women on this program? Oh, there are no competent women. Oh, I see. Well, how about? Mm -hmm. And he knew all of the women. So he did that kind of feminist job that was being done. And it was done by a man. I mean, it didn't have to be done by a woman. It just had to be done by somebody who would be e equally interested in the fact that women are being put down and, and, and narrowed. And I, my, my own feeling was that I really disliked the feminist movement for its concept of we need to have women discussion groups. Oh, yeah. uh, none of us, none of us would shut our mouths in the, in, I, I don't know, I can't speak about you, but I would say generally speaking, we, we were not going to not talk in meetings where there were men present. And so why were we training young women to think that the only way they could speak their minds was in fact to be in meetings where they themselves were, were all this. I mean, it's, it's just, it's weird. I, I, one woman once came up to me and said, did you realize that you were in that meeting with 14 men? And I thought about it and I said, yeah, you're right. I mean, it never occurred to me. And my students and the people I've taught, I've taught for it not to occur to you. Not to keep looking at whether, you're, whether there's a man or a woman and whether you should be speaking in the presence of men. And I think the women's movement made a huge mistake in trying to do that. And it was one of the reasons I never really joined into that movement because I, I thought it was retrograde. Well, you didn't have to do consciousness raising to be a member of the movement, no, I, I think. You were being restricted. <laughs> Well, yeah. no, no, no. I'm talking. I'm. I'm talking about one particular aspect of it, which was very strong years ago. Yeah. Which was this feeling that you, 
you had to have groups in which only women were present. Because, and, and many of the women who were in those groups told me, I don't feel comfortable speaking when there are men. Oh, gosh. And, you know, but they did. They told me this. And, and, and this was, you know, very much backed by the women's movement at that time. It's probably, you know, it's, 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 it's a relic, an antique. <laughs> but, but it was the thing that, that people, women were being told by the women's movement. And it was why I really did not be, join into the whole group when it was starting in the 70s. I mean, I just, I couldn't be part of that. Could I just confess another kind of discomfort about the feminist movement? And here I think you're going to disagree with me, Lee. But... Um, I think of the academic world as that it should be a meritocracy. And uh, I remember feeling strongly that um, if we wanted to get more women into academic jobs, what we should do is get them in at the entry level, uh, get more women in the pipeline to see what they could do. Um, but when it came to the tenure decision, I certainly didn't feel that we should give any preference to people, to women because they were women. I, I agree with you thoroughly. Ah. It's part of what I'm saying here is that, that I, I think that the whole concept, it hurts women for them to be in a position where not. you're being told, well, you know, you got your job because you're a woman. I mean, Good. that's all right. Then we're not the men They're going to be, that's going to yeah. happen though anyway, whether that, that was the truth or not, you know, I think. Um, well, that's true. It was going to yeah. happen, but we needed to stop it, not, not, not encourage it. Not Harvard encourage came it. to the law school. Some of the, uh, my husband was a law professor, so I was aware of Barbara's pioneering. Uh, some of, of, of the men in the law school said women are plenty smart, but they don't have the cutting edge. Oh, they, that's what the surgeon said in the medical yeah. school. <laughs> well, it's, it's, they, that, that's pretty good. Yeah. Sorry, but it, they, that women did not, they lacked the cutting edge. But I think that the law school, after you'd been there six months or so, <laughs> it changed its mind. It, the, the law school had, well, no, it was really, um, it, it, it was, um, I, I've just been writing my recollections and looking back on those days, but I was the only woman for five years, wow. um, and it was not, and it was very strange, and the students would say to me, how can you stand it in those meetings with all those white men? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I've spent my whole life with white men, you know? <laughs> but there was, you, you know, the, the um, sense that there, that we all benefited from the movement. Now, I much more directly, you know, because it was really the movement that brought me to this wonderful job at the law schools. All of a sudden, uh, the law schools had a what tremendous... Year was that, Barbara? That was 1972, but it was early 70s, and most law schools were like Stanford and had never hired a single woman, no not one. Edge. Though many women had, wow. that's it had graduated so from the law school, so there were plenty of qualified women. Um, but um, uh, it was, it, 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 it all did. Um, there was play. a woman who was president of the law review that they, Brooksley Born. Brooksley Born, that Brooksley. They, they, she doesn't have the cutting edge. She doesn't have the cutting <laughs> edge, yeah, she was just She's smart, quiet. she's smart. Yeah. She memorizes no. really no. well. You know, she was the one, she was the head of uh, the commodities Future, I think, or uh, and and she she uh, went off against the men who got us into the crisis in 2008 and was kept she was saying absolutely right. Yeah, she and was they, absolutely they right, and they dominated they, her. They yeah, it was terrible. It really they was. fired her essentially. Yeah, they essentially fired her. But she. But I remember that she. They would say she doesn't have the cutting edge. That that <laughs> that is um, ah. the true. And the other the other. Um, the uneasy relationship between the women's movement and civil rights uh, comes out partly, I think, because uh, uh, there, there was a, a real push to um, hire women and the thought that if, if we could get women, uh, we won't have to hire any minorities or we won't have to be pushed to hire minorities. That's um, what you're saying. That's what, yeah, Barbara's just... A, 
supporting me. Yes, no, that, so and, and that, that, so that was, that was part of it. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, that there's always been this problem. The, the law, law schools and many other parts of the university were really white male enclaves. And that has changed. I mean, that has really changed. And I think the women's movement had a lot to do with it. But it was all starting in your time, I, I think, of, um, of uh, so that the, you all are the truly pioneering. Um, what, let, let's have, let's um, um, it, it, see if there's anything else that you wanted to say about the effect of the women's movement on your own career or your co contributions to it, to it, um, if that is. Uh, Eleanor for, uh, might still be an icon of the feminist movement. Do you think you, your mm -hmm. iconic statue? <laughs> <laughs> I think the movement has changed, and it has uh, it has become more possible for women to recognize that the two sexes may have somewhat different life careers trajectories. The fact that we're the ones who give birth and men don't, it has, it makes a difference. It's got to make a difference. <laughs> it makes a big difference. And uh, so then you come up against all the big issues of, of, for women uh, becoming professionals. I think um, Betty Friedan was absolutely right when we got to the point of having small families and all the luxurious kinds of appliances we had in keeping house, it was boring to live a life of doing nothing except raise young children. You know, they grew up, and there you were without a career and so on. Uh, people have had to find their way around that, that, all the issues. Should I have my children while I'm young and then go into graduate school? Or should I do the hard professional work early and get established and then have the children? We've done it in different directions, haven't we, the group right here? Because I had my children very late, and you had yours very early. I had mine very early, but you know, uh, Len again was—he was this amazing character. <laughs> I wish we were here to tell, tell you his stories himself. But um, Len, I, I work from from 10 a.m. until 2 or 3 a.m. That's my my normal waking hours. Len worked from 6 a.m. to he was he he basically was into a book by by ten or eleven o'clock at night unless I kept him up because there was something going on. So we had these two e easy, easy um, overlapping times, but but each of us had time to ourselves that happened at those times. Um, as a result, he always got up and gave the kids breakfast, and I would wake up, you know, and, and take care of them until three or four in the morning. And then if they cried or something, he would wake up and take over. And this was just a natural rhythm between us. But he wanted that kept a secret. He did not want people to know about it in the early years. Huh. Hmm. And then when it began to be fashionable amongst the younger men to say that I'm helping to take care, I'm sharing childcare, all of a sudden, Len blossomed as a flower. He was terribly happy to tell everyone that he was to, he shared in the childcare, and the the younger families now share in childcare. I mean, it may be that the woman bears the child, but very shortly thereafter, you find dad with with the child carrier, he and he's really happy to feel that baby yes. right here. And well, the like fathers the have increased their percentage of time with it of child care time that's divided right. between them from 5% to 15. On that's average, wonderful, but, but, there's a but lot, it's yeah. the women who are still doing it, is my I, point. I, I think yeah. that's probably true, but amongst the ones that I know, um, you know, of, of kids I know well, from this generation. Well, in the world, I think you probably do get yeah. something closer to equality. I'm thinking the answer, what the, Oh, sorry. I was uh, going to say, when um, my children were so young, I've already mentioned the fact that I went to half time for a while. That was only three years. Then I went to two thirds, three quarters, just so I could be there when the kids got home from school and so on. 
um, I put them to bed, and uh, they would be in asleep by, say, 9 o'clock. I went to bed immediately, woke up every morning at 2 o'clock, and worked for two hours on the next day's lecture from 2 to 4 regularly, and then went to sleep and slept until breakfast time. My husband got up and got breakfast. I did that for 25 years. To answer or to shift the conversation a bit, uh, Barbara asked where we thought we made a difference to on the feminist movement for others, and in my case, it had to do with uh, students uh, entering the journalism field until very recently was heavily dominated by males, and women were usually kept to the fashion pages. They didn't go up the ladder to be managing editors. And because I was in the department and worked to help students get their first jobs and pushed the women students to not step back, I think over time I, I did make a difference on, on many women, young women. I think you did. Yeah, that, that, that sounds like it, seems like it. it's yes. true. Did, did you, were you active with Crow too, from your I was beginning? not terribly active. I attended the meetings a lot. I suppose I did a few things, but I don't remember specifically. Yeah. But the beginnings of that I referred to before were people were meeting informally under Elizabeth Cohn's kind of aegis uh, in the area where the communication department then was, which is now where the computer sciences or Jordan science the, the, the Jordan Hall area yeah. yeah yeah that's where the law school used to be too that's when right. I first came yeah. <laughs> yeah now do you do you have anything to add on that Nancy in terms of what uh, you feel might be have been your contribution to the movement or to that's the embarrassing I don't think I had much of a contribution. Kind of, well, to the by movement. having a well, having a successful Just career and having all a you've successful written. career, I yeah. guess, is a, yeah. some contribution. That's a big but contribution. But in terms of uh, active uh, participation, I didn't have much. Yeah. Sorry. That well, no. You shouldn't you, have embarrassed you, me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I take it back. But no, I do. I think what you um, what you said is, is the the truth that we all benefited from the movement and gave back to it by if uh, by, by being doing big successes. Well enough, yeah. By doing well enough, yes. you contributed to the advancement that's, of the that's movement. That's it. No, yes. and, that's the point. And I think you always feel, being a pioneer, um, that um, that you carry uh, the the whole sex on your shoulders. I mean, if you... Uh, I, if you say something stupid, you know it. It, it, it's because you're it a hurts woman. more more <laughs> than you yourself, and that's why I never spoke in meetings. See, um, just really? because I didn't want to take any chances. Yeah, that um, uh, uh, women would be uh, hurt. You know, and now that we have so many women, it doesn't matter. And I think I do think we're we're coming really in many parts of the university to the place. The meritocracy, where it's you know the the sex, the 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 race don't matter. Uh, you know, I I, We're I certainly moving moving in that direction. I think we are. Yeah, I well, want to. Women do. who become chairman of their departments, I think, have helped a lot. Uh, I know geology was fairly early on having a woman as well, head Lucy of the Shapiro department. Lucy Shapiro is is and a very yeah, very Lucy's important moving power feature in in the medical school, and that's been yeah. a long time. That, yeah. that that's been true, and and uh, there are several other women, Minx Fuller. I mean, we've had uh, we have a number of pow strong, very strong, powerful women. I mean, I see. I, I live in a really different environment because there was not, or at least we were protected against by some of these guys from from feeling the full brunt of sitting on our heads. But there was still the same thing. I mean, the issue was really basically getting the women to feel that they were empowered, getting the, the next generation coming in to feel like they, there, is, there is an alleyway for me. And I was going to tell a story a minute ago because there are two, depart there are two fields, microbiology and, and um, immunology. 
And when, one day at Asilomar, uh, microbiology was moving out and immunology was moving in as a meeting. And Len, you know, as, as I said, had made a point of seeing to it that women were represented on programs, that women came to the meetings, that women got postdocs, uh, and you know, we trained a number of the leaders in this, in this area. And so we came in, and, they came, and they looked, the, one of the guys came up to me and he said, uh, how come you guys have so many women in your field and we don't have any at the meeting? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the answer really is, is very much this question of somebody has to blaze this. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we need to believe it's women or men. I think we need to believe it's people. And I've always been very much this people person. You know, you be what you are. And that's, you know, Len, I don't know which one of us made the other one like that. We couldn't ever say ourselves. Mm -hmm. but, but that was, I think, uh, you know, to the answer of women, of, of why, you know, women perform. I mean, there's no difference in these two fields in terms of intellectual performance. There was just the question of how the field was going to look at the people and how the women were going to be perceived and whether they felt comfortable standing up and making an argument against what was on the blackboard or agreeing with it or whatever. And that was, the, that it was a very interesting test area. Again, it, it, you know, if somebody wanted to do research, that would probably be a way to go after it. I, I, I don't have any real data except that one funny comment. <laughs> that's great. Well, let's, let's, I think we're reaching the end um, here. And let's, let's conclude maybe with, um, what advice you might give to young people, young women, um, about their future at this point? Or any other thing you want to talk about? <laughs> Name a smoothie. <laughs> I um, had dinner last night with somebody's granddaughter um, who has just been hired by Google. I was so impressed with how unimportant all the issues we've been talking about would be to her. They'd simply take it for granted that they're going to compete for this job just with men or women, it doesn't matter. There's, I think they really believe their gender has nothing to do with whether they were hired or not. And I find this so refreshing. You know, what's interesting is how many of the heads of these computer companies are women. And you, uh, Yahoo, uh, I, can't, I can't just offhand say who they are, but there are about four that are head of the computer companies, the yes. CEOs. But that's that's still a very small number compared yeah. to Well, not the in terms of the computer companies. No, it is in terms of the computer companies also. Oh, there's sorry, a whole, I guess I'm there is, Nancy, I'm sorry. No, there is a whole culture now discussing this, that there, there's a boys' culture inside in the, these the computer technology. and engineering and the technology companies. And it's as bad as the boys' culture was in microbiology, if you like. Um, and yeah, the, right. the women get in, they get good jobs, they get be much better jobs in marketing and in, in public-facing jobs. In the engineering, the women still have to fight their way. And I've got a student now who's going to turn them all upside down. <laughs> she's a, a Russian woman who managed to get here from Siberia. And she's phenomenal. She's a mathematician. And boy, she, she went to the last meeting and she just was, she got up with the microphone and she was telling these guys what, what well, she's right. But the thing about her is that she was a model in Russia. She's gorgeous. She's tall, <laughs> skinny, <laughs> everything you can expect. So I guess my comment is that the, the younger generation is really where it is coming well, let me, from. Let me it's ask great. you, Ellie, there are a number of women who are heads of computer companies that we know of. I mean, the, the computer companies we've heard of. Uh, there, but there are lots more computer companies, engineers. And I'm wondering if uh, what you suggested isn't true, that the companies eventually are no longer just engineer driven, as some of them, some of them are. Uh, when they begin, they all are when they begin. They're not engineer driven, but business driven or management driven. And that, that's when the women can take have some leadership. Is that, does that support what well, you're saying? Lee? To some extent. Uh, well, no, what I'm saying is, is that women just, women will be engineers. I mean, Daria is one of my examples, but there are women and young women engineers now who are just going to come in there and say, no, move over. I'm as good as you are. And 
you know, I, I need a place here and they will get in. Um, I, I think it's, it's an evolution, like, like everything else, it's an evolution and then they will get in. One of the reasons Marissa Mayer, from, who's now head of Yahoo, went to Yahoo is because she couldn't go up the ladder at Google. But she did. who's head of Google? Uh, there's a man. Uh, yeah, uh, two, men, two men, Larry Page yeah. and yeah. Uh, Sergey Brin. And, and there are just so many, you're referring to them as computer companies, technology companies. I, I should say technology. Yeah. Uh, that exist out there without women in any management yeah. position. Yeah. But I have to say that Beckton Dickinson, which makes the, the cell sorter that, that Len and I have worked on, mm -hmm. has now in the last year brought in a president for their, the local BDIS unit, which is a, a very, very, it's a 1.3 billion or $2 billion unit. And uh, Claude is now the president of this. And they, for a long time, had a woman driving their, their business development. And now they tell me they've just brought in two other women. So all of a sudden, this very major tech, medical technology company is now being led by a majority of women. They have one head of engineering, and he's, he's happy to be with these women. But they had a woman in there before who prevented all this from happening and who was a very bad technologist and almost dumped the whole company with the way she... So women did the good stuff, women did the bad stuff, you know. It's good. We're, we're people. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And any, anything else on advice you might give young people or... Uh, Go where their heart is, is my advice. Yeah. Yeah. And Become an engineer. Become an engineer, right, right. There's a lot of openings there, yeah. for sure. I, I was asked recently uh, at a meeting uh, what advice I would, what uh, courses I would advise a young person who was interested in journalism, what they should take, and I said computer science, and everybody laughed. They thought I was kidding. <laughs> I was dead serious. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, absolutely, of course. Can, can I end with a very funny story that I promised I was going to tell? Oh, good. Today. Okay, good. And it's just, it's, it sort of is the ridiculous to the sublime again. Um, back when, when we had uh, in our lab uh, three women, me, uh, a woman named Johanna Lajster, whom I mentioned became the High Commissioner for um, HIV in Germany, and another woman named Ethel Jacobson. And we had a, we had a, Johanna was a stunningly beautiful woman. I mean, by anybody's criteria, she, she still is. And she would, would have cells to count, and she'd have to count them at, at what we called a Coulter counter, which was this counter, and, you, and it was up on a high counter, and you sat on a chair, and she sat on the chair with her legs crossed and, so that she could balance herself and fed the machine. And it turned out that at that time, we were not, it was con really not right to wear jeans or, or pants to the lab. You, you wore a skirt. You got home, immediate, immediately you threw off the skirt, put your jeans on, and went and did whatever you wanted to do. But we were not allowed to wear jeans to the lab. And so Johanna was very, very embarrassed. She would, she's very light-colored, and she would be red-faced because she'd sit on that chair with those gorgeous long legs. And we wore mini skirts at that time. You didn't wear longer skirts. So she was kind of spending her time between feeding the thing and pulling her skirt down. <laughs> and men used to collect at the door and stare in. Oh. And finally, Johanna and Ethel came to me and they said, what are we going to do about this? That, you know, they're, they're just, people just come there to stare at Johanna. So we said, all right. We're making a unilateral decision. From now on, we wear pants to the lab. <laughs> and that started, I mean, that was the first pants people wearing in the medical school, as far as I know. But it took doing it to do that, and it was really comical, and we still sometimes talk about it. Just recognize that that, that has been a, part of the revolution. A evolution. In, in fact, they, yeah, they, you know, it used to be when I started out, you couldn't wear pants to court. You know, and and, so and the right. legal thing, and and uh, we had a uh, a little law firm, equal rights advocates, and we kept a one size fits all dress there in case somebody had to go to court, see, so that they could put <laughs> on the dress. <laughs> but um, but, but I, any uh, women were not teaching in pants when I first came. Not at all. And I was the first one, I think, to teach in a pantsuit. And that would have been 1959. 
I guess in 75, I was still wearing a skirt to class. Were you really? Yeah, yeah. I, I've got a picture that I happened to notice recently, and I'm wearing a jacket and skirt. Yeah. That would be unusual no. for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, well, I think, I think we're all in agreement that times have changed and for the better. And, uh, and thank you all for the part that you played in it. Um, so you, you're, you're my, I'm the next generation. <laughs> and <laughs> and I feel, change, I've, right? I've always <laughs> felt uh, that I stood on shoulders of people like you. So thank you. Giants. Hmm? It, but, but, giants. Giants. On the shoulders <laughs> of giants. <laughs> That's what Good. Newton said. Yeah, yes, yes. Oh, aren't we giantesses? Gi <laughs> in, explaining, in explaining his success, he said, I stood on the shoulder of giants. Yes. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.